Hello, this is Eric Matisic, the CEO of Highwing, and I'm excited to welcome you to another great episode of Zoom into Insurance, where we spend time with the leading minds and innovators between insurance and technology to really understand what's coming next. Today, we have an amazing guest, Kara Buhonig. Uh, many of you know him as the founder of InsureTech Connect, but behind the scenes, he's an operator turned venture capitalist focused on catalyzing the digital transformation of financial services, data-driven marketing, prop tech, human resources, and really building bridges among entrepreneurs and investors and industry executives. We're gonna have a great time today uh, delving into Caribou's brain about how we got into InsureTech, but most importantly, to really understand what's coming next. The industry's never been moving faster, and it's gonna be really great to spend some time understanding uh, what's below the film and, and, uh, and the dragons that are coming at us that we have yet to fight. So Caribou, i uh, love, love to start off with a little bit of background. Uh, I know that uh, you had a lot of time in history uh, as an investor uh, in, in the financial services industry, uh, turned operator, uh, building the largest insure tech conference in the world, uh, and now back uh, as a partner in Semperverance Venture Capital. I'd love for you to give a little background of, of how you wandered into insure tech and uh, what really led you here uh, by, from spending time in, in real estate and investments. Hey, Eric, thanks very much for having me. Um, really appreciate it. Um, and uh, I, I hope you don't mind my sort of proud hat that I'm wearing today. Uh, the, the alternative is if I take it off, you know, your audience will be blinded uh, by the shininess I've got. So, you know, better for everyone, I think. Uh, so I've got a, uh, you know, a, a pretty um, straightforward uh, story here. You know, started my career at Capital One for a decade, um, really cut my teeth on uh, using data in business. Um, from there, uh, I, I did have the good fortune to collaborate with a couple other former Cap One executives, and we created a boutique venture capital firm called QED Investors, uh, very focused actually in, in fintech and, and the like. Um, the, uh, uh, you know, because we did a lot of fintech and a lot of banking, people sort of thought that maybe we'd be interested in insurance as well. We, you know, we, we knew a good bit from our background on the, the sort of banking financial services, but insurance, you know, at, at most we could be uh, sort of honest pretenders, um, you know, at least, you know, being open and curious and inquisitive. We made a couple insure tech investments. Um, I, I like to, you know, brag, I guess, that I made my first insure tech investment back in 2011, right, in a um, uh, uh, automotive telematics company, if you can believe it. And actually had my first exit in, in a telematics company in 2015, just as things were starting to get like really interesting in this insure tech thing becoming a thing. So um, uh, around 2015, 2016, it, it did smell like something interesting was about to happen in this category. Uh, I raised my hand in the firm, said, look, I'll, I'll carry the torch here on insure tech. And that's what you know, led to insure tech connect coming about. I was looking for a good industry conference could not find anything that met my needs. So I was like, well, I need this to exist. Maybe I should create it. Uh, luckily, got connected with Jay Weintraub, who's uh, my co-founder and the CEO of the event. Um, he actually knows how to do that kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> and, you know, but, but I asked him, look, build this for me, right? Build it for a focus group of one. Like, make, make it so that I want to go. And then I think there'll be other people who want to go too. Um, and, you know, from there, got to make some investments in uh, the insure tech category. Uh, I've been able to join a couple um, uh, boards of insure tech startups um, as an independent director, actually, after I left QED. And, and now I'm actually getting to play in, um, you know, a few other adjacent spaces, including um, sort of the employer as a distribution channel. Um, which is, you know, obviously relevant for like the benefits world, but also for some parts of PNC too. So, uh, you know, I, I'm getting to enjoy sort of uh, building uh, and, um, you know, building my own, you know, capabilities off the things I don't know. Hey, well, that's awesome. It's, you're exactly right. Around that 2015, 2016, there was a, a feeling in the air that something was going to start to really move in the industry. And that's, that's, that's around the time that I started to get really interested in, in insure tech as well. And you could just seismically feel that th those two words started to belong together. Um, now that you've you know had uh, you know five six years of uh, engaging the industry, and I think will this be your fifth year of producing Insure Tech Connect? It depends on how you think about last year. <laughs> <laughs> this will actually be the sixth year of it. 
um, you know, including last year, which was a little different uh, than that. We, we did it. We made it through. It was, it was awesome. We, it, uh, still, still had a lot of great discussions and yeah. found it really valuable. Um, when you look at that period of time, uh, you know, insurance has always had uh, a wrap for not always moving the fastest. But I feel like in this chapter of, of, uh, of innovation, uh, they've really picked up their step and tempo. Um, what, what, are, what are some of the things that you noticed or, you know, how's the landscape changed from, you know, when you started seeing the industry come together around the technology and innovation uh, sprint that, that, that we're now in to today? Uh, and, and, you know, what, what's, what, are, what, is, what were some of the big things that you saw kind of evolve through the last five years? Yeah. So, you know, when, when you talk about speed for the insurance industry and how it's been accelerating, you know, I, I think that actually has started in the boardroom. Um, so I think it started with, you know, ins this insure tech thing actually became a board level issue, right? And CEOs uh, and, not, you know, not just chief technology officers, but CEOs had to answer the question, hey, all these insure techs, right, whether they're the customer facing ones or whether they're, um, you know, ones that are trying to sell you on how to use the technology, like we need a strategy, we need an answer. Even if the answer is we're gonna wait and see, that's fine, but let's make sure we have a plan here for what we're going to do about it. Uh, now, you know, I, I just alluded to COVID right, for last year. I, I actually think that no surprise, COVID kind of bumped up on the board's list there, like, okay, how are we dealing with the pandemic? How are we getting our employees back into the office? So InsureTech in a way dropped a couple notches, not, became, not because it became less important, but because there were some like really urgent COVID things to deal with. I, I think as we get past COVID, InsureTech will rise back into the, the top three. You know, I think that the, the, um, uh, there's been all this opportunity that they have seen right, and have started to adopt. Right? I, one of my, my catchphrases, I guess, is the APIification of insurance. Um, which I know is near and dear for you, Eric, but is. I've been uh, saying yeah. it even before you and I talked about it. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> you've, been, you've been building it before I, before you heard it from me, and I've been saying it before I met you. So we're, we're sort of on equal footing there. But the... the uh, I'm a fan. I'm a fan. Like, like, really, like, that's that's been the thing. And I've got the, maybe the benefit of having, you know, been in the, the banking side of the world for a number yeah. of years before this. So um, it, it's like a crystal ball, right? Look at what has happened in fintech. And it doesn't guarantee it'll happen in InsureTech, but it sure does sort of beg some of the right questions like, oh, APIs have really taken off right eight years ago in fintech and banking. Maybe that'll start to happen now in, in the insurance world too. And oh, look, there it is happening. Um, you know, I think uh, you're starting to see uh, embedding of insurance, right? As well as embedding of, you know, banking type of products, right? That's one of the sort of buzzy trends going on. It's actually enabled by the existence of APIs, right? Um, right? There's, a, there's a whole sort of sequence, like you kind of need the cloud, then you need the APIs, then you get embedding. Uh, but that, that's clearly one of the things where entrepreneurs are you know, building their businesses with that strategy in mind. VCs are enthusiastic and looking for the companies to fund that have embedded as part of their strategy, at least. All right, so that's certainly uh, been one of the trends. And then, uh, you know, on the, also on the funding side, like entrepreneurs no longer in insure tech really have to answer the question, can anyone build a multi-billion dollar business, you know, as an insure tech? Now they might ask, can you, <laughs> right? But not, can it be done at all, right? And, and four years ago, five years ago, that was a question that every insure tech entrepreneur had to answer multiple times over. Right? So I think there, there's also that sort of accelerant in here, you know, the sort of first wave of uh, insure tech companies, you know, seed funded in 2016, 2017. Um, uh, you know, some of them have now had those big exits built in some cases, real businesses. And, you know, that's encouraging. And, getting the flywheel spinning and, you know, back to the, the boardroom, like, oh yeah, I, you know, you, in the boardroom, they, they've got to pay some attention and, and insist that there's some, some plan here, at least for the, the incumbents. You touched on a little bit around the API, API application of the overall stack. And, 
And now we're seeing embedded insurance versus just some of the connectivity between the cloud and, and systems. Uh, when you think uh, about some of the investment activity this year, uh, it's really interesting because a lot of the companies, to your point, are API first, data-driven businesses. Uh, and we're also seeing at the same time um, all-time record highs of investment uh, in the insure tech category. I think, I think Q1 you know, reached an all-time peak uh, as it related to kind of global investment in insure tech. Do you think we're at the, towards the top of the mountain? Are we at the peak of the mountain? Uh, are we are we halfway up? Like like how 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 big do you think the market is as it relates to some of the investors' appetite around the future of what we're trying to build here? So so I was I was asked a similar question by some some folks earlier in the day. Right? <laughs> um, though you're you're my only podcast of the day. This was wasn't I'm not reusing any material. I promise. <laughs> the, 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 the but they were asking like you know essentially is this sustainable? Yeah. I'm like, I think you're asking two questions there. I think you're asking like, is this going to keep going on? Is there more opportunity, more stuff to build, more value to unlock? And I think you might be also asking me, are these valuations like over the top? Are they are they not just frothy, but are we in a bubble? Um, and, and those two things sort of connect to each other, but they're, they're separate. So I'll start by saying like, look, are valuations healthy, right, for companies, whether in public markets or especially in... Uh, you know, the, the private markets. Uh, yeah, they, they, they are and and they're healthy, right? Perhaps frothy um, in you know, sort of not just in insure tech, right? Not just in fintech either, by the way, like all over the place. Um, I mean, I, I was, I'm involved in some health tech uh, on uh, and, and future of work kind of investments. And, you know, COVID has actually been a this boon, this tailwind for many of them, right? Because the need for what they were doing has always been there, but COVID accelerated the, the, the sort of demand and pull there. So there's a lot of valuation, but it's not like tulips, right? The, the entrepreneurs are not building things where if you said, oh, well, what if the valuation multiples return to historic norms, whatever those are, right? To five years ago, right? Yeah, it, it, it might be, uh, we might have fewer millionaires and billionaires coming out of insure tech over the next few years, but they would still be real companies, right? And there would still be funding available for them. Um, uh, and, and so valuations get reset all the time, right? Um, but, you know, in a, in a tulip kind of world, right? The inherent value or the long-term multiple applied to tulips is pretty low, right? Go, go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you can see the value of a, the multiple on a tulip. Um, I, I think that the, the long-term multiple on insure tech companies I don't know if it's going to go down a little, a lot, or stay where it is, or, oh my gosh, go up even from here. Um, but there's fundamental value being created. And, and it comes from unlocking all the technologies that have been sort of at a core level built out right? and are now figuring out their application case to the insurance industry. Right? You, you, I mean, the internet, I like to say, transform banking. The internet didn't actually transform insurance all that much, which is, I, I still find amazing to say out loud, like how could the internet <laughs> not transform something? But, it, but you, you get the internet plus smartphone, smartphone plus cloud, plus API, plus machine learning, plus a, a lot of uh, great satellites in, in the sky now that can create some, some new underwriting data. Like there's so much there now that, um, you know, insure tech is doing a lot of the heavy lifting uh, to bring the underlying value to the industry. And that doesn't say that the, the uh, carriers and brokers aren't also doing so themselves, but like it often makes sense for you know, a, a tech company to like build out the capability and license it to a dozen carriers or two dozen brokers than for two dozen brokers to build it each individually for themselves, right? We don't, we don't each need our own little machine learning module if these guys over here will license, will build it once and license it out 20 times. Now, you know, and, and you also get competitors arise, right? You, you've got the customer facing insure techs. Like, no, I'm not gonna license out my technology. I'm gonna use it to compete with you, right? And that's, that's good, that's healthy, but it's all based on there's this so much ways of doing things better, whether more efficiently or more effectively, or finding ways to serve customer categories, customer segments that we didn't know how to serve well before, 
Mm -hmm. Oh, we have some, this, this, this customer looks lousy. I'm going to underwrite them at, at this point here. Oh, but now I'm able to unlock a bit of rooftop data based on the satellite feed and apply some machine learning to that satellite feed and realize, oh, it's actually the, the core, the real underlying risk should be underwritten here, right? That is, you know, really what, what insure tech is all about. It's about bringing the benefits of the technology to the industry, whether it has to like outcompete the industry or serve the industry, you know, different ways of skinning the same cat. I, I really liked your comment on uh, the internet has not changed insurance uh, and, and it's, it's, it's happening now. And it's just, I think, uh, you know, the, the internet is, is definitely starting to move insurance, but you're right, you know, for a 20 year period, uh, there was very little change in the process of the overall buying and selling insurance during the internet boom, which uh, the irony is that, you know, you know, now in this massive velocity of, of, of catch up, which is really exciting. When you, when you think about, uh, you know, insure tech connect in, in, in 2019, I think that was the year that you said um, the number one trend is the API ification uh, of, of the insurance stack or of insurance. As you start to look into 2021 and you we've gone through or coming, you know, through, you know, uh, the edge of a pandemic um, and we're looking at some of the new technologies that are happening, uh, whether it be, you know, blockchain or uh, really advanced tooling around uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, what, what are some of the things that uh, in 2021 that you're paying particular attention to or you're seeing uh, really as you know, some of the cutting edge technology that, you know, carriers and, and leading brokers need to be paying attention to? Yeah. And now I'll start by quoting uh, my, my co-founder, Jay Weintraub. Um, I love his saying, right? The biggest trend in insurance is insure tech. Like that, that, that is sort of, I actually think true. So, so um Double clicking there, going a little bit deeper. So, so you know, I, I'm I'm not technical enough to have a true technical view, but I am intrigued by this low code and no code trend. Right? And there's a, a handful of companies now that are really trying to enable right insurance and insurance products and insurance experiences in a way that you know, they call no code or low code, right? Where you don't need to be a, a software engineer or a developer in order to actually create the experience or the product. Now, uh, I, I've been starting to think about that, starting to understand what does that mean in practice? And I think I would say it this way, um, and I might be wrong, right? I, 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 I'm, I'm wrong often enough that I, and, and in this case, I know I might be wrong. Uh, uh, but I think it means that we're, we're shifting from um, sort of, if you want to offer something to a customer or potential customer, you have to actually construct it now in a low code or no code environment. What that really means is you're going to configure it, right? So I don't need to program it. I just need to configure the building blocks. Um, and, and I like that, right? Because I don't see financial services products of any sort as monolithic, right? The notion of a, a you know, uh, auto insurance policy, right? Or a workers comp policy, right? It's not just a thing, right? It actually consists of many little component pieces, right? Sometimes to the detriment, right? Because now yeah. you've got like eight pages to understand what each little building block is and you know, therefore we, we, you know, ask the customer to actually not understand any of it, any of it, that, you know, that's not so great, but I think fundamentally like an insurance product can be reconfigured in a lot of different ways. And I think the, the no code approach is making that easier, right. And taking the, the technical, uh, people out of the process and empowering therefore product managers and folks who, and brand managers and people who are in charge of distribution, right? Because once you take some of the technical expertise out of sort of reconfiguring the offer, right? Now you've, you've gotten it one step closer to the actual insured, right? I'd rather have my product manager be able to set it up and iterate quickly and sort of come right out of the focus group and say, okay, here's what we're gonna do now. What do you, do you wanna buy this? Then to have to have them, you know, create a whole user spec, right, for the the technical team to code. 
So I, I think that's interesting. We'll see how that goes. Um, you know, I, we, we talked about embedded. I think that's significant. I think we're seeing more and more tools um, for uh, for the the distribution side. Right, uh, more tools for the brokers. Uh, you're starting to see more and more exchanges and marketplaces. Right, pop up. I mean, Bold Penguin, right, um, which sort of plays in that space, bought by American Family. That's an interesting validation, I think, of of the traction that Bold Penguin was getting on that aspect of it. Um, uh, uh, you know, and then uh, I I I can't not you know keep coming back to COVID. Um, I, I think that COVID is a platform shift. You know, so. For, for folks who are you know old and bald like me, right? We remember the PC replacing the mainframe. Then uh, the internet is another platform shift. Then the smartphone. Actually, I actually think COVID. We were kind of overdue for another platform shift. And normally they're like computing platforms, but no, it, it's actually COVID is the next platform shift right? that makes some industries, some old ways of doing things, obsolete. Mm -hmm. And actually gives rise to entire new industries, not just new businesses, but new industries because of the shift, right? In the same way that Uber could not exist without the smartphone, right? The smartphone gave, gave rise to Uber, right? Um, so, you know, think about ghost kitchens, right? So a restaurant without the dining area, right? Which was starting to emerge two years ago, but boy, that got accelerated with COVID. Mm -hmm. Think about the, the telehealth medical practice that's distinct from the traditional in-person medical practice, right? I like to ask particularly like, um, you know, the, the sort of commercial insurers out there, like when you get an application for a telehealth practice or for a ghost kitchen, are you underwriting it the same way as a, a traditional restaurant, a traditional medical, medical practice? If you are, I'm almost sure you're underwriting it wrong. I don't know if it should be more expensive or less. I don't know that. I just know that if your answer is it's the same, that that's the only answer that I can't believe. Right. So as we think about like what's coming, what are the other sort of industries that get almost created out of the you know the, the new the new continent, right? That comes to comes out of COVID, right? And you know how do we serve those? without just trying to cookie cutter some old framework so, you know treating it like an old kind of business uh, when it, it has different risk characteristics, different needs as well. I really like your perspective on that. I think uh, your, your leading uh, trend around low code and no code uh, really has us raising our eyebrows because uh, even looking at, you know, I, I always look at, uh, you know, events and gatherings like yours as kind of a proxy of energy within the, within the category. And when you start to bring seven to 10,000 people together to talk about insurance technology, uh, there's definitely something happening at scale around, around the world and the topic. But most importantly, you know, having attended, you know, for the last, you know, four years, uh, looking at the, the audience, there was always, uh, especially as it got larger, uh, the number of innovators, people who were building companies and actual technologies versus those who were trying to understand and implement and engage and buy those technologies or understand those technologies. You saw that you saw that, that teeter-totter start to shift where you have a lot of spectators that are really just trying to embrace the value of insure tech around this technology movement. And uh, with something like low code and no code, I get really excited about enabling that group of insurance innovators uh, with technology that they're not necessarily uh, need to be that school or skilled in understanding to your point, you know, dragging and dropping and a code builder effectively. I can't imagine all the new tools and widgets and things that are going to be built by insurance agencies and by carriers and even by insureds to start to reinvent the way that they manage their insurance process. And so, you know, we've definitely got a keen eye on that. And I, I too am really, really excited to see that, that, uh, that, that evolve. Well, and, and that loops back to the APIification of the industry because once there's an API for something, right, that Ooh. can be a box that now the product manager can just drag and drop. And if the underlying no code environment, right, sort of is doing its job, the, the platform figures out, okay, how, what's the communication protocol that I can suck in the data or create some action with that box? Great, right? But I, as the product manager, don't need to actually know the the under underlying fittings between the pipes and i no longer need to ask 
uh, a scarce software engineer uh, to construct a custom fitting there for me. So, you know, I, I think it all sort of is, is a very virtuous cycle. What, what are some of the uh, trends you're seeing with some of the, the, the large incumbents when you think about the large carrier policy admin systems or broker admin systems? And you probably have a bird's eye view as it relates to strategies around, you know, Salesforce and SAP and other large players that are kind of trying to further engage. How are, how are they adopting the, the APIification in your words? Yeah, so, so, so I'll start by saying, Eric, you probably give me a little bit more credit than I deserve, um, <laughs> uh, which is probably good. Most people give me way too much credit than I deserve. You're only giving me a little bit more. Um, look, I, I think that the, um, I think that the, the, the big tech vendors, right, for instance, um, I think that they are trying to leverage their strength around they get enterprise like and they have credibility and they have a really broad suite of things they can provide right and that's in contrast maybe to your you know the the b2b insure tech startups that may have great technology great software great product right but maybe don't always get enterprise right um i, I always like to joke with my with jay my co-founder like when he says something to someone and they they sort of can't quite figure out what he's saying, I say, "Oh, look, I speak J. Let me translate." I, I I think that the the big enterprise you know sort of folks know how to speak enterprise, right? Uh, and a, a challenge for the the startups is to, to to bring their great product innovation, but also to speak enterprise there. Um, you know, I think on the flip side is how can the uh, the traditional larger vendors how can they be sure that they're staying far enough on the leading edge right, that um, they're not, you know, complacent in, you know, what they, in the business they can derive simply by bringing good technology, but packaged in the right way for the enterprise. Um, you know, but I, I think also you see um, the, the carriers, right, have really wide variety of strategies too around these things. Some uh, are, you know, very much wait and see. Some are, I want to be, you know, blazing the trail. I'll, I'll accept that it's inefficient, right, in order to be the first mover in trying something out. Um, uh, some are, uh, you know, very keen. I want to be the second mover. Right? Uh, I, I, I remember speaking to one who said, like, I believe this particular type of technology is going to get commoditized. So as long as I believe it's going to become commoditized, I want to be like the fourth or fifth mover. Right? I don't want to be first. I don't want to even want to be second. Right? Let other people, my competitors, pay for figuring it out until it gets commoditized. And then I'll just take it off the shelf when it's ready. Like, right? again, it, it, back to the boardroom conversation, like, you know, it's, it's, there are many different types of plans the only bad one is to have none at all. It's, we often like to discuss that the, the process uh, around uh, procuring and buying insurance isn't broken. Uh, it just happens to be inefficient. And, and so you're exactly right. The default, uh, even though the default you know, could include taking a, uh, additional time at adopting technologies, uh, it, it's not impacting uh, your day-to-day -day ability to uh, work with clients uh, submit to markets and actually, you know, bind policies. And so uh, you're, you're and, and, and that's partly probably one of the reasons why we've been a little bit slower to innovate. Um, but I do like uh, the carriers and the brokers out there that in your words, uh, they accept some inefficiency to be first blazing the trail. Uh, those, those are the ones that, uh, we, you know, we're betting on and we really think are going to start to set the tempo uh, of this next chapter in insurance. Uh, bring it, bring it full circle. Um, as we talked about trends, and we talked about some specific technologies. Uh, if you were sitting um, at a leading brokerage right now, uh, trying to digest this just sea of insure tech, I've got services, I've got tools, I've got my incumbent large software platforms bringing me new uh, opportunities. Um, how would how would you prioritize internally some of the innovation uh, activities? And you know what are the what are the key things you might be focused on? So I might think about it in terms of offense and defense, and you want to have plays on, on both sides there, right? So you want to place some defense in terms of making sure you're bringing in technology to improve your efficiency. Right? So, you know, I, I would readily 
predict, assert, whatever you want, that in 10 years from now, you know, the, the volume of business that a broker, like a human, a person can serve should be like twice what it is today, right? Because they'll have the benefit of using technology of various forms, right? Um, the, uh, and, and by the way, in doing so, they'll be able to serve their, their clients, their customers, at least a little better, if not a lot better at the same time. But, you know, and they'll, they'll pay a little technology tax, right, in order to do so. But, you know, if I can, if I can support twice the volume today, I'm happy going to pay 10%, right, um, to the enabling layers that's, that enable me to do that. Um, and, and by the way, like, if you don't invest in finding the the capabilities, the providers, the technology that's going to double your efficiency in the course of 10 years, whether as an individual or as a firm, someone else is going to. And if they're going to become more efficient than you, then over time, right, that's not good for you. I mean, I, I will admit, I, I was in a room full of brokers a couple of years ago, and I made this basic prediction, like in you know 10 years, you, know, you all will be twice as efficient. That's great. The only bad thing is I think that means that only half of you need to be doing this. Right? I'm not sure that they really liked hearing that from me, uh, but like it's competitive and you got to invest in the efficiency and that's sort of playing defense, uh, but that playing defense can improve your bottom line, right? Which is important. Um, and then playing offense, right? Where can I engage so that I can actually create more revenue for my business? Right. How can I plug into this ecosystem that's emerging so I, that in a way that actually lets me source more customers? Right. Now, by the way, that's actually, to be honest, a little bit of an easier topic for the carriers and the brokers. Right. It's also a source of anxiety, right? uh, especially for the brokers if they're worrying, are the, is my carrier trying to do that are they trying to find some end run around me like you know I, and channel conflict is was happening long before insuretech came about right so it's it's, it's not uh specific or new to this but like you know the uh, I, I am although i'm sort of a direct consumer guy by training i send out direct mail by the truckloads and stuff like that i'm actually not one who thinks that oh you know the the distribution of insurance is going to dramatically shift over to direct to customer um, yeah, I'm sure there'll be some interesting instances where that happens, um, and there are some benefits and there are some costs to it. Fine, but I I think that the embedded insurance, right, the channel partners, that that's a little more interesting. So, you know, that's more of a threat if I'm a broker that I should really be worried. Like, how many brokers out there listening to this, you know, did actually sold tuition insurance, right? Tuition insurance is being sold out there on the UVA um, uh, bursars uh, website and, and many others, right? But because it's such a natural fit with the, um, uh, with the sort of embedding approach, right? Doesn't really go through brokers very much at all, right? Or travel insurance, right? When you're buying an airline ticket, again, like that shifted because right, it's just embedded into there. Those kinds of distribution partnerships, right? I would actually say like, if a broker can actually plug in and be an enabling layer, right, uh, for that kind of distribution, if, if they can be the conduit for insurtechs who are developing new products, right? If, if you're a broker with some volume and you, you see some of your customers aren't getting their needs met, like that screams opportunity to me, right? Because that means, well, you should go find some insurtech who will provide that product that you can move for them to serve your customer, right? The belief has always been the agents and brokers know the customers best. They are closest to them. If that's true, and I'm not going to make enemies or friends by saying whether I believe it's true or not, but if it's true, if the brokers out there believe that they know their customers best, then I'd say, well, great, prove it by actually coming up with some product needs, telling some insure techs, right? I got this pool of business over here, just waiting for the product. Come on, insure tech, go build it. And they will, because what the insure techs are really good at 
if they're good at anything, should be building products. You, you started touching my, uh, my last question as it relates to really, how's the insured involved in this overall transaction? And, you know, uh, specifically, uh, insurance has always been built in the relationships, especially in the middle and large commercial market. Relationships run really deep and, and, and really drive some of the uh, activity as it relates to the buying process. Uh, when you think about technology in the world we're in, uh, we've seen some of the work, even in some of the businesses you're involved in, like Ken, as it relates to personal lines and, and uh, even above the chain, small commercial starting to evolve. You mentioned Bold Penguin. Uh, how, how do you how do you see this insure tech trend uh, really changing the dynamic of that uh, handshake and uh, those lifelong relationships that have uh, driven a lot of the insurance history? So you know I, I'm probably biased because I don't play golf, so <laughs> I'm I'm I'm, a, I, I'm not necessarily in that 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 handshake folks group in the same way. Uh, no, look, um, I I think that what does the handshake do? What what there's really, what does the trusted advisor do? Yep. You know, which is another word for broker, right? So I'm going to stop calling them brokers. Let's start use what we, what we aspire them to be trusted advisors. What's the role? What's the, what do I hire a trusted advisor to do? Right. Not, not be my friend. I hope, right. I got other friends, but number one, right. To give me advice, like, oh, here are your options. And then essentially to reassure me that I'm asking the right questions and not making a mistake. And that that's what they need to do. Now, there are other ways to solve that same problem, right? Some some work well, some not as well, right? You know, once upon a time, right, there was a trusted advisor for planning a vacation. And an individual vacation or a large corporate getaway. And yeah, the, the large corporate getaways are slower to sort of shift over, but even there, I think pieces of the value chain shifted over to more of a, a digital approach, but people, the, the consumers who are going on vacation, were still looking for a trusted advisor. They were just looking for, but it was being, started to become delivered in a different way, right? Is that a great place to go on vacation or not, right? In the past, I would ask a travel agent. Right? And they would hopefully tell me the truth, hopefully. Um, now I can go to TripAdvisor right, and sort of see the reviews from 300 people, right? In ag I don't trust any one of them, by the way, but in aggregate, right, all 300 are probably have some collective insight there. So, so I think that there is some, some shift here that potentially can happen. But again, right, that, that, the good news is that doesn't mean that the traditional broker has to go away, right? The traditional broker may have to adapt, right? Maybe I want to, when, when the, when my broker says, here's the policy for you, right? That's great. I'm maybe people will start to get used to asking, well, how has it worked for 300 other people? Is this independently reviewed? Are there any, can I see any reviews on it? Right. Um, I mean, I, I think those kinds of approaches, right, which are both necessary in the digital world, but enabled by the, in the digital world, become interesting. I think it becomes a nice sort of match if actually uh, that, that human trusted advisor, I'm not going to use the word broker, the human trusted advisor can sort of bring together both their personal credibility and personal knowledge and the sort of credibility and knowledge of the great digital world and package them together, I think that might be really great for the insured. I think that's a, a great place to wrap up our discussion and leave uh, this uh, great discussion around innovation and really talking about some of the, the future trends around low code and embedded nature of insurance and most importantly, how code has impacted us all. Uh, I, I love the analogy around uh, offense and defense, uh, making sure that uh, you, what brokerage firms are playing defense to be able to drive efficiency, but looking at offensive ways to, to really grow revenue. And uh, most importantly, I'm really excited to spend some time with you face to face again as Insure Tech Connect 2021 uh, comes back to an event in Las Vegas uh, later this year. Yeah, and time for my shameless plug there, Eric. You know, uh, uh, October 4th through 6th, the Mandalay Bay. 
So, so if people are feeling like they uh, are, are safe by then, and I, I think they will be, and certainly I'm hoping people will have their, their vaccine by then. And, and care about, uh, for the audience, if you don't mind, can you tell them where they can uh, find you and connect with you for those who are interested in, uh, in learning more about uh, your awesome wisdom? Um, at least my thoughts and, and uh, points of view. I'm, I'm not going to go awesome wisdom either. Um, uh, sure. So uh, first of all, easiest thing, quite honestly, you can uh, Google me because uh, fortunately there are not many uh, caribou honigs out there. Uh, I'm also happy to, uh, to be found on LinkedIn. And um, uh, we've got uh, also a website for Semper Virens. It's Semper Virens VC, but that's going to be almost impossible to spell out and people will just be guessing at the Latin. So if you find me on Google or LinkedIn, um, that, that's probably the easiest. Thank you. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time uh, and making the time to spend some time with us to zoom into insurance. Uh, we're in the relentless pursuit of trying to speed up uh, the insurance industry to make it uh, easier, more fun, and exciting uh, for brokers to work with carriers and most importantly, deliver a better product to insurance. So we really appreciate your time. We appreciate your support and uh, can't wait to see you carrying the flag around the industry, around the APIification of our future. Uh, we're huge, huge advocates and supporters of your vision around, uh, around that work and uh, excited to continue to, to see uh, the new investments that you make uh, as you go into 2021. And uh, we'll see you in October in Las Vegas. Right, Thank thanks. you so much, Caribou. My pleasure. Thank you again for tuning in to a great episode of Zoom into Insurance. If you like this, please subscribe to our channel and make sure you share it on any social outlets that you seem fit where insurance professionals are hanging out to speed up the insurance industry. Thank you so much.